Okay, please take your seats. Please take your seats. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jenna Burbich, and I'm a program officer here at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's program on terrorism and the dark web. We are delighted to be joined by our speakers tonight. Nader Bakos, Senior Fellow for the Program on National Security at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. Joby Warwick, Journalist at the Washington Post. And our moderator, Stephen Anderson, State Department Visiting Fellow at the Chicago Council. We look forward to hearing their insights on the rise of global terrorism and the role of technology and social media in terrorist communication networks. A few housekeeping points before we begin. The Council is a membership organization, and we would like to thank our members for their support, which makes it possible for us to produce affordable, accessible, and independent content. If you are not yet a member, this may be the perfect time to join, and I hope that you will consider one of our membership levels for $100, beginning at $100. A brief disclaimer. For nearly a century, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs has provided an independent, nonpartisan platform for a variety of different voices to promote deeper global understanding and active U.S. engagement in the world. Views expressed by individuals we host are their own and do not represent institutional positions or views of the Council. Turning back to tonight, please know that we are on the record and live streaming. We welcome your engagement on social media, but please turn your phones on silent. Later, we will take questions through microphones around the room and through our browser-launched app, which you can find by typing in chi.cnf.io on a web-enabled device and select tonight's program. The link will also be displayed on the screens. Before I turn it over to our speakers, I'd like to spend just a few more moments introducing them to you. Nader Bekos was a CIA analyst integral in investigating the relationship between Iraq, Al-Qaeda, and 9-11 attacks. She appeared in the Emmy award-winning documentary Manhunt, The Search for Bin Laden, and her latest book, The Targeter, My Life in the CIA, On the Hunt for the Godfather of ISIS, chronicles her journey from Montana to working at the CIA also working way, her way up the ranks to the front lines of the war on Islamic extremists. Joby Warwick is a member of the Washington Post's national security team and currently writes about terrorism, the Middle East, and weapons of proliferation. He is the author of Triple Agent, which chronicles an Al-Qaeda member who infiltrated the CIA, and Black Flags, the Rise of ISIS, which was awarded the 2016 Pulitzer Prize for nonfiction. And our moderator, Stephen Anderson, is a career member of the Senior Foreign Service Class of Counselor. He has served multiple tours in Iraq, Iraq and Afghanistan, where he primarily worked on the management of provincial reconstruction teams. Most recently, he served as Deputy Chief of Mission and Chargé d'Affaires at the U.S. Embassy in Madagascar. Lastly, at the conclusion for tonight's program, the cash bar will reopen, and we invite you to join our speakers for Young Professionals Meetup and Networking Reception starting at 6.30 p.m. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our speakers. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much, Jenna, and uh, it's really fantastic to see such a, uh, a full house here tonight. Uh, we, of course, uh, every one of us remembers 9-11. There's not an American who does not remember exactly where he or she was uh, the day the second plane crashed into the second tower. Uh, that changed the way we view terrorism uh, throughout the world. Now, of course, 16 years later, the uh, counterterrorism efforts are better coordinated at the federal, state, and local levels, as well as globally. We also have brought the fight to the terrorist organizations where they operate, trying to disrupt, dismantle, and destroy them at their root locations scattered throughout the globe. These efforts, as well as the new security procedures at airports and seaports, do make it seem unlikely that we're going to have another 9-11 style attack in the U.S. anytime soon. Of course, the terrorist networks have adapted ably to our counterterrorism tactics, and they remain active with an increasing number of small-scale attacks over the past decade throughout the globe. 
And of course, New York two weeks ago is a reminder that it can also come here to the United States. You could possibly say that the terror networks of 2017 have adapted or adopted new technologies and gone low tech at the exact same time. These increasingly decentralized and self-directed terror networks are that much harder for law enforcement and intelligence agencies to track, and they create new dilemmas, both ethical and tactical, for Facebook, Google, and the other tech giants, really creating a new type of terrorist network that we need to target in 2017 compared to 2001. It's really a privilege for me to moderate this discussion with two leading experts who have tracked the change in terrorism from 2001 to 2017. I'm going to go ahead and ask Nada the first question because you've been involved in this since we've started paying attention to it. So maybe you could just uh, explain to me how we're in a terror 2.0 right now. So my my time at the CIA actually started um, before 9-11, but I was not yet in the Counterterrorism Center. There was a group of women, largely, that were charged with looking at Al-Qaeda and the growth of that organization from what they thought was just this franchise of loosely fitted individuals that were trying to achieve a goal but wasn't quite clear in the 90s. And then as that progressed, they understood that it was actually a, a giant bureaucracy. Um, that was leading this organization was Osama bin Laden. And his whole goal, really, at the time, was taking back power from the United States um, for the Middle East, to put it simply. Um, I actually entered the Counterterrorism Center um, right before the Iraq War started. So I was on the team charged with looking at whether or not 9-11 and Al Qaeda had anything to do with Iraq. Our team found that it did not have a connection. Um, that was, of course, briefed to the White House and to Congress on the Hill. So I watched this organization, Al Qaeda Central, um, from a finance perspective prior to the Counterterrorism Center. And then the dismantlement happening after 9 11 um, by the military and intelligence community. And then watching the um, progress of Abu Musab al Zarqawi, who was building this organization that eventually became Al-Qaeda in Iraq in 2004. So the 2.0 that we're looking at today, from my perspective, is really just this evolution of what Al-Qaeda's dismantlement ended up driving, in addition to the demise of Al-Qaeda in Iraq and, and the growth of ISIS. When you're looking at the, the fracturing of Al-Qaeda Central and all the franchises around the globe, that to me was sort of this beginning of this next generation of the 2.0. I think we're almost on to 3.0 at this point. So how, how do they operate differently now than the way Al-Qaeda operated 15 years ago? 15 years ago, Al-Qaeda Central was a very covert organization. Al-Qaeda in Iraq was a very covert organization. ISIS became this quasi-government, basically. They were operating in the open. You knew exactly where the territory was and what their goals and aims were. They were communicating all of this. Um, so ISIS really changed the way terrorist organizations function. They became much more overt. Um, it became, they became very clear as to what they wanted to accomplish. Al-Qaeda had been delivering that in messages that had been released, but not in the same way that ISIS does. So, the evolution of ISIS um, and, and where even they are now, I think, has really turned the corner for terrorist organizations to then drive back underground, become much more covert, and start to reassemble. So, Joby, if we have a different kind of terrorist network, presumably we need different tools for the fight. Could you? Uh Talk to, me, uh, talk to us a little bit about uh, what those new tools are. Yeah, and absolutely, and, and Nada is correct in saying that this is a, it's been an evolution. We've seen these ter terrorist organizations go through different phases. I like to think about sort of the iconic figures that, that we've seen over the last 16 years, starting with 
bin Laden and Mohammed Atta, the guy who was the leader of the 9-11 attacks, professionals, guys who, had, uh, who were engineers and middle class uh, people from a from middle class background, then shift to who's I, or ISIS icon, it's Baghdadi, it's Jihadi John, these guys doing these, these atrocities on the internet. And now there's this third phase, and you think about people like uh, uh, Safula uh, Saipov, the man who drove a truck into a crowd last week in New York, or the one, the Abedi, who blew up a concert arena in Manchester, England. Or my favorite, there's a, a guy uh, who went to a train station in Brussels in July with a, a bomb and tried to blow himself up and, and, and kill passengers and, and ended up just causing a small fire and was shot and killed by police. But the, so what this new evolution is, it's, it's much less uh, directed, it's self-directed, it's not organized in any serious way, it's crowdsourced, you get the sense that uh, there's this broad appeal to everyone, anyone who can do something to, to do it where you are. So that requires an entire different set of tools than what we used before, not the traditional uh, things that we used to do to try to find and, uh, and track uh, Al-Qaeda's network. We still need to do those things. But now it's much more diffuse and it's a much more difficult thing. So it's, it extends to subjects like counter-radicalization and, and not just fighting terrorists with traditional tools, but finding ways to stop the ideology from spreading much more difficult challenge. So, I mean, there's counter-radicalization and then there's counter-recruiting. Uh, is how, how, do, how should law enforcement, intelligence, how do they tackle those uh, specific problems uh, differently? So counter-recruiting is a little bit easier because it requires communication between a, a core leadership or between sort of leaders of ISIS and people who potentially become involved. Sometimes it's, it's literally is a matter of recruiting. Sometimes it's just a matter of, of, of coaching, mentoring, trying to get people to try new things or to, to use tactics in their, in their in terrorism. Uh, the, the radicalization challenge is, is much more difficult because it's, it gets to, to broader societal issues and it's something we don't do very well as a society. We're just beginning to wrestle with the fact that in order to stop you know, lone wolves from carrying out attacks, you have to, to, to deal with them in their communities before they become active, before they break the law. And that's much harder to do. It involves working in the community, working with imams and community leaders, trying to stop some of these hateful messages from getting out in the first place. And that's very hard. And we can talk about that. But it's a, it's a different tool set. And Ned, actually, we were talking a little bit before the uh, program started about your views on sort of the division of labor between federal and local law enforcement precisely to uh, sort of go after that specific problem that Joby mentioned. Uh, could you maybe repeat that uh, for the group? So my background is primarily Central Intelligence Agency, which is focused on overseas. So everything that happens overseas um, and the growth of terrorism overseas. But I also worked at the Joint Terrorism Task Force with the FBI as a CIA representative. And from my perspective, what I saw missing is what was working well in places around the world that the agency was actually able to affect situations um, it was a local policing, and it was the community policing. It was the being able to talk to the local PD and ask them about, you know, a certain community and it, you know the health and the needs of that community, and understanding um, challenges for that community. You couldn't, from my perspective, from the JTTF, I could not find that. We we couldn't find that interlocutor. While there's local PD, you know, with JTTF and with the FBI, and there's different centers around um, with DHS, there just wasn't this cohesive sharing of information. So I've thought about this a lot <laughs> because I keep coming back to, I'm getting asked the question, how do we deal with lone wolves and what do we do in the United States? And it's what Joby was saying about the broader societal issues. How do we know what some of those are unless we understand the health of the communities that we're dealing with? Now, are there places overseas, I mean, in your experience, or Job, in your experience, that do this, where they do the effective community policing in order to track down the, the potential lone wolves? I personally have only seen pockets of this. There's, I have not seen a broader program. There is a big distinction, of course, on how we do intelligence and law enforcement gathering versus Europe as well. You see some of it more in Europe, I think, than we do in the United States. For us, it's still a foreign concept. I mean, for law enforcement to, to figure out how do we communicate with imams, so who, how do we begin that outreach, 
Do you see that starting to take place in, in JTTFs in Florida, for example? It's just there a few months ago, and, and they're trying to do this, and it's often with skepticism because the chief of police in one little town is saying, why should I have a dedicated officer whose job is to go talk to local Muslims and try to figure out how to communicate with them so they can trust us and report things that they're seeing? But some are beginning to see that as, this is important. In countries like Belgium and France, where they have much bigger uh, Muslim populations, they're beginning to grapple with this in a more systemized way. And they're seeing problems in the local communities, but they're also seeing problems in prisons, which are a big source of radicalization and recruitment, because you have these jihadi, some of them coming back from places like Iraq and Syria, and going straight into jail, because that's the plan right now. You take these guys right off the plane sometimes and put them in prison until some kind of judicial process begins. But that becomes a jihadi university. There's a core of radicals in some of these European prisons, and they, they recruit new uh, members. They, they uh, radicalize others. And so the Europeans are having to figure out, how do we do this? How do we separate the really bad guys, the charismatic uh, returning fighters from the rest of the population? And then how do we try to reform them? And that's a big challenge. I think, in fact, uh, al-Baghdadi was radicalized to a certain extent uh, in prison in Iraq, if I, if I recall. Sort of going along with, uh, with ISIS, for someone like me, the, the big difference that I had seen between ISIS and al-Qaeda is ISIS actually in 2014, when it took Mosul, uh, the third largest city in Iraq, it essentially became, I mean, it became a caliphate, it had territory. How did that change the way that uh, we fought terrorism since they had actual territory? Well, for the first time we really had, a, had an army and a, with a location. And if, you, if, you're, if you're claiming territory, then you have an address and we know where to find you and we, we're pretty good at fighting people from fixed locations. So it, really, once the caliphate was formed, it was a matter of time before militarily we were going to defeat this thing. But you can't underestimate the, the abilities that having a physical place capabilities that this gave to ISIS. They have a, a sanctuary from which they can plan all kinds of things, not just locally but around the region. They can amass wealth, which they did. They had hundreds of millions of dollars of hard currency in the banks that they had seized and were able to make many tens of millions more through selling oil and through shaking down local populations. They had an arsenal that just would be the envy of al-Qaeda you know, 15 years ago with tanks and uh, you know, machine guns and even helicopters and, you know, just everything you could possibly imagine. And so for them to have a, a sanctuary like they did in Iraq and Syria made them much more powerful but ultimately led to their downfall because we can, we know how to defeat people in, in, in fixed areas and eventually we were able to do it. And they also had a fairly sophisticated media set up. Uh, could, uh, could, uh, Nada, could you talk about that a little bit? Uh... And well, they're, they're still using media tools for propaganda. Um, ISIS really has honed how to, how to use social media. Al Qaeda Central's videos, when you look at those now and you look at what ISIS is, has done, it's like watching you know, movies from the 1980s on VHS <laughs> versus today. It's, it's quite something. I mean, their production quality and everything, they've really taken it to a whole new level. But they're also savvy with the way that they use social media. Um, and they use a lot of this just for propaganda, for recruitment, for sharing their message and their intent. And one of the tools that they also use is called Telegram, which is um, another type of app that has chat rooms and you have to be able to know the address where they're actually sharing their information. And it changes all the time because they get shut down and they have to pop back up again. But just until recently, their videos were living on YouTube. Uh, YouTube recently took down um, Alaki, a cleric who is an American that had been using English propaganda for Al-Qaeda. They actually removed his videos. So I think there is some interest by some of the platforms, the technology platform companies, to start pushing out some of these um, Propaganda videos, Twitter has taken down many ISIS accounts when they've been nominated. They come right back up, of course, because anonymous accounts are allowed. Um, but they're very, very savvy at how they conduct business. There's a, there's a lot there that you just said, and that goes to the heart of what today's discussion is about. But uh, we've just about defeated ISIS militarily in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, so I'd like to just take a step back before we go into the technology. and. How is the, I mean, should we be celebrating that victory? I mean, is it over? Is ISIS done? Uh, how are they going to respond? Uh, Joby, I think that you've uh, written a little bit about this. Yeah, and, and, and you're, you're right. There's, there's, 
the battle going on on two different levels at once. You've got the fight over the caliphate, and that's going quite well. We've seen ISIS's territory shrink to about 10% left now of what it was in its heyday in 2014. But two things ISIS did. They built this physical caliphate, this, this place that people could come to. They also built a virtual caliphate, which is a propaganda machine, which is global, which see, has no boundaries. And, they, and as Nada said, they've become very, very good at using it. And what it means is that you know, the, the, the terrible stuff that we see, the beheadings and the, and the sort of these uh, awful atrocities we see on video, is just a small part of a bigger campaign to put out a positive messages to present ISIS as a utopia, as a place that any good faithful Muslim would want to immigrate to and be part of because this is, this is part of a changing of, of, you know, a correcting of the course of history. And so that survives. It's not putting out as much material as it used to. Since the fall of Raqqa, the, the number of videos has been cut by about a third. We've also seen the message change. Instead of being sort of these hopeful, uh, positive messages about how great ISIS is, the content has turned to instructions about how to carry out terrorist attacks where you live, sometimes very detailed, uh, explicit instructions. We've seen other, use the branches of the, of the caliphate pick up this, the slack, and you're seeing more videos out of places like the Sinai, or out of Leba or, uh, or Libya, um, out of East Asia, other places where there are uh, active cells. And so that presence still exists, and it's not going away. And no matter what we do in Syria and Iraq in the next few weeks, it's going to continue, and that's going to be our biggest challenge, certainly as Americans and as Westerners, in trying to stop bad things from happening in our countries. So we have a, a media-savvy and a tech-savvy terrorist network. Uh, today's discussion is titled Terrorism in the Dark Web. Uh, the closest good answer I could get to, the dark, to what is the dark web was when I asked my 21-year-old son. But uh, Neda, could you maybe sort of draw out for us what is the dark web and how is that different from what most of us do when we Google dark web? <laughs> Well, if you take out your phones, we can start with the yeah. tutorial. I think uh, the misperception about the dark web is that this is a big encrypted environment or an app or something, when really the dark web is, is about not being traceable. It's being able to access encrypted apps or URLs that are not publicly known, that you'd have to know what the URL is to get on to the site. Um, it's, it's really just an underground way to access the internet. Um, there are encrypted uh, applications that, of course, that they use. Um, WhatsApp was one of them for a while. Um, but those are a separate entity um, from the dark web. And I, from the research I've done, the people I've talked to, I don't see ISIS as a huge user of the dark web as I defined it. They're not moving goods necessarily, um, unless they're antiquities <laughs> or something of that line um, on, on the dark web. They're not, they're not the illicit financiers that are moving goods and, and selling things. So they're not really using it for that purpose. But what they are doing is, is using some of the encrypted apps, and like we talked about the Telegram, to, for their propaganda purposes. And they're, the way that they're communicating is offline. And, a lot of, you know, the individual sharing of information is offline. It's not in these encrypted apps necessarily, but um, I think Joby can also speak to this, probably more so on the Telegram side even. I think ISIS itself, it has also figured out they need to evolve to being a covert organization, where they went from this, you know, communicating overtly what they needed and wanted to do. Now that they're asking people to carry out some type of terrorist attack on their behalf, um, they need a way for these people to communicate with them. So I think they, they probably will start utilizing some of these things even more. So Joby, I'd like you to, to add a little bit onto that, but for example, Google, Facebook, they all know that I like Italian red wine, and they micro-target mm -hmm. me with, you know, with advertisements wherever I go on the internet. Uh, why can't we use the same kind of tools, or, mm -hmm. or why can't Facebook or Twitter flag Hey, um, this person is, you know, looking at uh, uh, terrorist material. Yeah, obviously we do know how to do this, and fortunately we are starting to do it. So the big companies, the Googles and the Facebooks of the world, are starting to get into this game a little bit. It took way too long. It took about two years before anyone was really organized to try to stop some of this bad propaganda. But now we 
have some of it figured out. And to give an example, so if, if you're a kid today in Egypt and you're sitting at your computer and you, you're on Facebook and you Google something about ISIS or you look up an ISIS video or you have something ISIS related on your laptop, into your news feed, this wonderful news feed we all have, up pops unsolicited a little video that has a counter message. It might be a little bit of a cartoon, it might be a, an interview with someone, but it's a counter ISIS message, usually from somebody who's been in the caliphate, knows these aren't good people, they're not good Muslims, they're terrible people and they're murderers and they're crooks, and, and you get that side of the ISIS story. And that shows up in your news feed without you asking for it, and it just plays automatically. And this is something that took some years to put together and figure out how to make this effective. The other thing we had to figure out is, what messages are credible? Because if we tell some Muslim kid that, you know, what, what good Muslim is supposed to be, it doesn't mean anything. So we need to get it from people who are authentic or seen as authoritative. So we mostly have, we've outsourced this problem to some of our allies, to the Emiratis, to, some, to Saudis and to others who can speak the language, who know the sort of the cultural references and the ways to kind of communicate it as messages clearly. And it appears to be working. It's hard to measure, you know, success in an area like this. How do you tell whether some kid was turned against maybe committing an, a, a terrorist attack because of he saw this message. What we do know are these kinds of, of, uh, of animations and messages are being seen. The numbers of clicks are very, very high. So we are engaging with an audience out there. And hopefully it's having an effect. It's better than not doing anything, which is what the case was before. So Jeremy, that's related to uh, some terminology that I wanted to get out there. Uh, there are three kinds of uh, categories that uh, counterterrorism officials refer to. There's the directed, there's the enabled, and there's the inspired attacks. Uh, could you comment a little bit on that? Right, and we've seen examples of all three of these. So directed means ISIS sitting in Raqqa or wherever they are these days, from the little hovels they have left in, in uh, al Qaim down the border between Iraq and, and, and Syria. There's not much left, actually. They directly communicate with their followers to, to carry out an attack. Saw an example of this in November, uh, the November 2015 attack in Paris, where there was direct communication with some former fighters who had moved to Paris for, for the purpose of carrying out a terrorist attack. They had encrypted video chats. They, they talked back and forth using WhatsApp and other in, in, in encrypted devices to, to essentially organize a plan and then carry it out. Direct, so the, in, um, uh, the second one is the uh, directed, directed, enabled, and inspired. Yeah. The ones that are enabled are more sort of resources, uh, adding sort of advice or coaching or, or, or just practical help. An example of this, just in uh, July of this year, a couple of uh, uh, ISIS sympathizers down in Australia tried to blow up an airplane. So they had a, a plot in mind. They had sort of a way they wanted to do this, this deed. And they reached out to ISIS to get advice and to, to get a little practical help. Somebody in, in, in ISIS actually airmailed components of a bomb to them, just on the, in the, on the regular air mail, so, com, you know, dis disassembled components to an to a explosive device and some actual explosives, went through the mail and showed up at, at these guys' location, and the plot probably would have succeeded, but the device they built was too heavy and it got flagged by, by the check-in folks when they were trying to check in their luggage, and that's really about the only reason this thing didn't work. But that's that kind of uh, sort of practical aid and advice that you sometimes see. The other is the inspired stuff, just giving people ideas. Sometimes it's just rah rah for our team, do something for ISIS, we're being killed here, do something you know, wherever you are. Or it might be something very explicit like you know, drive a truck into a crowd. The messages ISIS puts out on, on, on that front aren't just vague, you know, take a truck and, and run it into a crowd. They're very, very detailed descriptions about the kind of truck you want to get, the best, best places to get them. They want, to, want you to get a truck with a, with a high front end so you can easily drive over a curb with a big engine so you can gain some momentum and really get ahead a of speed before you head into a crowd. Detailed instructions like that. And these they're posting widely. They're not sending these on encrypted apps. They want everybody who could potentially do this to see this material. And so we, we see it. Almost every week you'll get a new, uh, uh, you know, a new posting like this or somebody advising uh, ISIS supporters to try to, dis you know, um, uh, try to have a derailment of a train or just any kind of, of crazy notion, start a forest fire. Just there's a million different ideas that keep churned out by, by, by people in ISIS and just, just trying to give people general advice about creating mayhem where they are. Nada, early on, and in fact you mentioned this uh, in your opening comments, uh, we did an awful lot to target the financing uh, of terrorists. The kinds of uh, attacks that uh, Joby uh, just mentioned don't strike me as, uh, uh, as needing an awful lot of financing. Uh, 
no one needs to send, well, they, I guess they do need to send uh, spare parts, but uh, are they sending money? Are we still following terrorist financing with the same interest we did uh, 5, 10, 15 years ago? Well, I'll, I'll answer that with the caveat I don't work at the government anymore. Um, but that's a natural course of some of following some of these organizations is, you know, we know where ISIS received a lot of funding when they captured territory with the banks that they captured, some of the oil fields they were controlling. And now it'll be up to the intelligence organizations to be able to find out how will they continue to survive? Where, where will their financing come from? And, and hopefully track some of that and see where that actually ends up. But uh, to Joby's point about mailing the, the parts, um, it's actually an, an article in Foreign Policy uh, that Adam Ronsley did recently about how easy it is for them to mail some of these things out of the country. Um, they take it into Turkey or surrounding country, and then they mail it home, essentially. Some of these you know, pieces for a bomb or some of the antiquities they want to sell or any, anything along those lines. So I can see them using that more and more as a medium. Yeah. Now, um, Trump administration has uh, been in office for about nine months, uh, just celebrated one year since the election. Uh, how would you describe the Trump administration's uh, strategy uh, against terrorism, and uh, do you think that they've been effective? I mean, not to be glib, because I have said this several times about even other administrations, but it's not clear to me what their counterterrorism strategy is. It hasn't been clearly communicated um, in a way that I understand a strategy. It's, um, it's been wrapped in things like limiting immigration and the travel ban, and I see these things as not affecting terrorism and countering terrorism. Um, I would say they've continued some of the kinetic activity that, that was being done still under the Obama administration. Uh, but other than that, it's still not clear to me what the strategy is. Maybe I missed it. Now, you, uh, you did have uh, quite the back and forth with. <laughs> that was glib. I'm sorry. <laughs> glib was usually short. You, you... <laughs> <laughs> you spent a while being glib on that. Uh, you, uh, you had quite the back and forth uh, about the, uh, the travel ban, uh, criticizing it as a recruitment tool. Uh, could you uh, talk a little bit about, uh, about that, how, why it is that you see it as a, as a recruitment tool for ISIS? When I looked at the list of countries on the, the travel ban alone, that alone told me that you were not doing this for the purpose of counterterrorism. This has nothing to do with terrorism. What did Chad ever do to anybody as far as counterterrorism was concerned? <laughs> um, so my criticism really stems from the fact that I see the, the list of countries. It's mostly targeted at majority Muslim countries. It's not targeted at countries that are either financing, funding, propagating uh, propaganda, um, anything that would seriously put a dent in terrorism. I don't see those countries on that list. So Joby, the administration has prosecuted fairly effectively the uh, sort of the war against uh, ISIS in Iraq and, uh, and Syria. Um, how would you uh, qualify their strategy yeah. or their implementation of so let's give them some credit for, for certain things. I mean, let's, and let's also stick to the, to the facts and, and, and keep the spin aside. And the spin, of course, was early on that the Trump administration had a secret plan for getting rid of ISIS. We still don't know what that plan is, and we haven't seen any evidence of it. And the other was, of course, uh, the president was just saying the other day that, he's, uh, that ISIS is on the run because he's in office and, and the military culture has changed to, to reflect his leadership. That's not apparent from the evidence that we see on the ground. We do see, and you have to give the, the Trump folks credit for this, is they've, they've pushed or military decisions further down the chain. That's been sort of something very deliberate. You can see that coming from, from Mattis and, and others, uh, sort of experienced generals who've been doing this for a long time, so that commanders in the field have an ability to act much more quickly on intelligence and to carry out strikes when they see opportunities. And if military folks, intelligence folks we talk to say that's, that's a good thing for the most part because it does allow a, a greater tempo. It allows us to kind of pick up the pace of, of what was already a very robust campaign that has been in place for more than two years. The, the central strategy that we see unfolding right now started back in 2014. It involves a coalition of countries. It's always boring to talk about. We've got 70 countries including 40 Muslim countries who are all signed up to help us defeat ISIS, and they all have skin in the game, and the ones who are closest to the action have a lot of skin in the game, including the frontline troops. 
Our troops aren't the ones, we're not the face of the, of the ground campaign. We try to be as, as invisible as, as possible because we don't want to be the face of, of, of the fight and we also don't want to be the occupiers when this thing is all over. So that part is, is, is been, it's just carrying out a strategy that's been playing out for some time and, and we have to hope that this will continue until ISIS is completely beaten as a military force. The thing that is slightly worrisome about this policy is the reason that the Obama folks were a little bit slow sometimes is because they were very, very careful about collateral damage. They didn't want to kill civilians. When, when they were trying to bomb drivers of trucks, they were hauling oil and gas to, to markets in Syria and Turkey. They would sometimes drop leaflets to warn the, these civilian truck drivers who were just mostly just guys from the local neighborhood to run away because they're about to blow up your truck. And that's, if you're thinking about the long game and how, if you think about the fact that every civilian that you kill creates more enemies and makes our job harder in the long run, it's actually a good thing to be deliberative and careful. So that, that balance is a difficult thing to strike, but um, at least sort of the, the essential parts of the, of the strategy seem to be in place from before. I think I can't do any better than that. And uh, I'm going to turn the conversation over to you. Although my, the first question that uh, I'm going to uh, uh, take is here from our online subscribers, because it goes at a, uh, at a question that, uh, that I had sort of raised in my initial comments about the new ethical dilemmas, you know, back in 2003 and four, we had Jack Bauer and the debate over, over torture, and now it's the debates about the uh, surveillance state. Uh, so uh, for either of you, what is your opinion on encrypted messaging and dragnet mass surveillance? <laughs> uh, but I I do believe that we have to abide by domestic law in the United States. Um, we have, of course, the Patriot Act that happened after 9-11 that allows more surveillance than it did prior to that. And I think it has to be updated and thoughtfully policed because where we were on 9-12-2001 is not where we are today. And some of those authorities don't apply. Some have eroded. Some are not necessary and are in overreach. So I think, from my perspective, I don't see a dragnet surveillance, um, especially in the United States domestically. Of course, I worked foreign intelligence. But I'm hoping that there will be a much more uh, thoughtful application to what we do when we renew some of these things that came about after 9-11. I've got one more question that I'm going to take here before turning it over to, uh, to the audience uh, here. Um, Nada, Nada, you mentioned that uh, we're not seeing much use of the dark web for terror finance. How about cryptocurrencies for terror finance? I don't know. Joby? Well, the, the ISIS... That smile is, said he's got something. Well, just, just ISIS is... The thing is that you can't overestimate these guys for the, for the most part. I mean, there's... These aren't rocket scientists running ISIS, but and so the things they do are often kind of predictable and and pretty straightforward. So they came up with this great idea: let's let's strike our own currency. So ISIS, if you go to the to the promised land of, of the Islamic State, you'll see they actually have coins in circulation. They have passports. They've they have all the infrastructure of government they've managed to create. It they they use Bitcoin. That's another thing. That's uh, I guess you could use credit cards to to pledge money to ISIS. They use all the typical things. But these are things we know how to deal with. And the financing issues for ISIS are a little bit different because unlike Al-Qaeda that was very clever at the way it moved money around the world and did use a lot of, of donations from wealthy Gulf uh, you know, you know, potentates who, who, would, who would give money so covertly, they get all their money the old-fashioned way, which is they steal it, they shake people down, they, ex they, ex they sell stuff on the black market, they do all the usual stuff, and we, we pretty much know how to handle that kind of thing. And that's why you see ISIS is financed in a world of hurt right now. They can't sell oil anymore. They used to sell it to the Syrians and the Turks, the guys who were also fighting them on the ground, which is always kind of interesting. But we've put a stop in that. We managed to get rid of their hard currency assets the old-fashioned way. We found out where their repositories of cash was and dropped some bombs in strategic places and literally saw hundreds of millions of dollars in euros and dollars go up, go up in, in flames because we blew up their, their stockpiles. So we've been pretty good about shutting down their, their financial pathways so far. Great. I think I'll take an audience uh, question. Uh, just a reminder, please uh, ask a question. Uh, not a, don't make a statement. Um, right here in the... Second, uh, second row. 
We have a microphone that will be coming to you. The lady in the middle. You criticize the, little, the list of the travel ban. How should be improved? Which country should be included? First, I have to really understand the, the need for the travel ban. That's, I still am not understanding what the purpose of the travel ban is, because it was sold as counterterrorism. Um, banning people from coming from countries that promote terrorism or have harbored terrorists, you are going to be expanding it to quite a large pool of countries at this point. I mean, if you want to go back to 9-11 and you look at the 9-11 hijackers, Saudi Arabia has to be on that list. That's probably not likely for the United States to do that. So I don't, I'm, I'm questioning the, the effectiveness of even having this type of list. Joey, do you have any comments? I just would add to that, that there's not a, a counterterrorism professional out there who won't say we could do a better job of vetting people who come to this country. We can always improve our security, and that should be job one. We should make sure our borders are secure. But you don't necessarily accomplish that through blunt instruments like saying, well, we're just going to pick countries, and these aren't powerful countries like Saudi Arabia, who we're never going to ban, but other countries that, have, let's face it, every one of the, the, the fatal or lethal terrorist attacks that have taken place in our country since 9-11 have not involved any of, the, any of the countries that are on the travel ban, not a single one. There hasn't been a single Syrian refugee who has killed anybody over here. And so if you're just saying we're going to arbitrarily ban these countries and that's going to solve the problem for us, then we're kind of missing the point. That's kind of not, not, it's a blunt instrument and not the kind of smart policy that we need to, to implement, which is really good vetting and being careful about who comes here and who doesn't. People have the misconception that you can be a kid from Yemen and get on a plane tomorrow and come to New York. It is really, really, really hard for, for, for anyone to Yemen to come over here without some kind of sponsorship, without a, a scholarship to a university and all kinds of vetting. If you're a refugee, you've got two years of clearances to get through and maybe even then you can't get in. So it, it's it's... It's great we're doing all that vetting, but just saying that if you're Syrian, you can't ever come over here, it not only doesn't, isn't effective from a terrorism point of view, but it also sends a message to people from Syria that are trying to work with us, including our good allies who really are doing the, the butt kicking, to, use, to be blunt about it, against ISIS in Syria. They're the ones that are helping us win this fight, and we're giving the message that because you're Syrian, you're automatically untrustworthy and we're not going to allow you to come over here. That's not productive. And one other thing I would add to that is when you use resources for policies that are not effective, you have taken them away, because it's not an infinite pool of resources and money, from things that would be effective. Please, over, over there. Okay. Um, there have been proposals circulated, and they've been quite controversial about using social media to vet uh, visa applicants, for example. So that way you know, and the, that, you know, let's say somebody in the embassy will be able to look at somebody's Facebook history or their Twitter history. Why has is it not been implemented already? Because that's probably a pretty good indicator of that person's online activity, what their interests are, and potentially could be quite a good indicator of somebody having those nefarious purposes on their visit to the U.S. Good question. Well, personally, as a former spy, I would never rely on somebody's social profile to tell me who they are and what their really intent is. I mean, I was trained to be deceptive. And if somebody is, has an interest in hurting us here in the United States, they're not going to be posting that necessarily on their Facebook page or on their Twitter account. Or, and if they are, they're doing it anonymously. I just, that would be something I would not rely on um, as something that would be an indicator. I'm going to follow up on that question a little bit. We sort of described Al Qaeda um, operatives as being more sophisticated, more directed. Uh, whereas the ISIS guys uh, are a little less sophisticated, uh, maybe didn't know that they're radicalized until after it's happened, wouldn't there be some traces along the way that they would leave on their social media as a result? You know, I think it, it is a useful data point. I mean, we collect biometric data from, from people who want to come into this country, so why shouldn't your, your social media postings be at least a, a data point? You shouldn't rely on them, absolutely, because people can be very clever about concealing things. But if, it's, if you've got a record, I mean, this is, essentially, this is how we catch uh, the potential terrorist in this country now by kind of who's been, you know, spending time on what website and, and posting things that look like they're a little bit dangerous. That's how people get on our radar screen to begin with. So it becomes relevant when you are looking for people who, are, uh, who have had terrorist or terrorist sympathizing backgrounds. 
but it can't be the only, uh, it, it can't be sort of determinant factor because as data says, you can be very, very slick about how you disguise what your, your, your true feelings are. And that was the intent of my answer, like if that was the overall data point for trying to understand who that individual was. Right. I like this particular wine because they have the history going back two, three years. So even though somebody, you know, has to leave their speak Twitter. speak in the microphone? Oh, yeah. No, exactly what I was alluding to is the fact that Twitter or Google, you know, you have a history going back years. So we've even seen and when something happens, people begin to dig up other people's history and, mm -hmm. oh, somebody made a posting four or five years ago, made this comment or made this uh, Twitter. So again, you wouldn't want to rely on it exclusively, but have that as a background information, for example, I guess. I, I agree. I mean, mm -hmm. I've, I don't know if you have experienced this. I mean, I've, you know, different organizations that you join or a job, they ask you to open up your Facebook page so they can go through it and as a vetting process. I think it can be a data point, yeah. Great. Do we have some uh, more questions? Gentleman right there, raising his hand. I'd love to see some of our younger members of the audience also throw out some questions right there for the next one. Yeah, I, I won't give you that younger part of it. Uh, um, so um, I'm going to pose this to Joby. So if ISIS is focusing on random local acts of, of, uh, of violence and terrorism, shouldn't I just believe that that's the last gasp of a loser? I mean, what? how do you recruit people to a strategy that's just hurting other people? Yeah. It doesn't sound like it goes anywhere, and I feel like it's the last gasp. Don't you? Yeah. Don't you? That's, a, that's a real good question. There's, there's two ways to look at it. I was just actually talking to a very senior um, intelligence person a week or two ago. And we were pretty much observing the same thing. The stuff that you see them doing now, these, these little crazy acts, you know, taking a, you know, a Home Depot truck and then, you know, running over people and then coming out with a couple of toy guns. I mean, it just seems long-headed. It's like, who, who are they recruiting for these kinds of things? And the answer is they're recruiting people who are essentially losers, people with mental issues, criminal backgrounds, people who are kind of never you know, washed up in their personal lives. We, that's, that's a clear pattern. It's people that in the old days uh, you know, used to join ISIS in order to go overseas and kill people. Now it seems like you kill people in order to have you know, admission into ISIS to sort of join their ranks almost posthumously. But there's kind of the, the sort of double-edged sword part of it is, as this um, intelligence person was sharing with me, this seems to be, we seem to be approaching the limits of the capabilities of their ability to do things. Uh, it's not to say that someday they won't be able to pull off something dramatic, more of an, a 9-11 style, but this seems to be what they're capable of right now. The bad part of it is, we're also approaching the limits of our ability to, to stop these kinds of attacks. Because if, you know, how do you stop somebody who's just gonna get in a truck and veer off into a, a lane of pedestrians and, and take some lives? And just a simple act like that, as unsophisticated as it is, it sure riveted all our attention, didn't it? Everybody, it accomplished the purpose of terrorizing people and making us all fearful that something bad is gonna happen in our hometown. And I travel around the country talking to people about my book, and you go to Paducah, Kentucky, and people are convinced that ISIS is going to blow up the mall next week, and people really are afraid. And so in that sense, this, this is an effective tactic. It just fortunately isn't, isn't very effective in, in, in killing a lot of people. And it's just unfortunately not stoppable. And is the goal to kill people, or is the goal to terrorize people? Well, I mean, it seems pretty effective from what you just described. Yeah, they, they, they want casualties. In fact, this is, uh, when you see the, the appeals that go out, you know, there, there's always this, this sense of trying to maximize the number of people that you can take out. And, you know, the more, what does it matter if there are women and children, uh, it's, it's this, this part of this ISIS disease, which is the most disturbing thing about it, is it's completely indiscriminate in its use of violence, and also almost revels in the brutality of, of what they do. So. Mayhem and, and, uh, and bloodshed is just is part of you know part of what they're seeking and you know the more the better for them. The, the young lady up front, second row. Thank you. My question is specifically for Anada. Um, so you spoke briefly on the um, the current administration's strategy or lack thereof. Um, on this topic, so could you elaborate briefly on um, the implications for 
current either analysts abroad or for the international community on such a lack of strategy as a former spy? Well, as Joby mentioned, they are continuing the program, at least, with some of the allied uh, forces that they started in 2014. So there is a continuation um, as far as a new strategy or an overarching one beyond that. That's what I'm not as familiar with. Um, but what that, that doesn't mean that intelligence organizations and the State Department uh, they're not doing something at this point. I'm, I'm sure it's continuing work. Uh, Mattis has taken the trajectory for the DOD in another direction. I'm sure Mike Pompeo has not taken his eye off the ball on counterterrorism. He seems to be very, you know, focused on terrorism itself. So I don't, it's not that I think that organizations themselves aren't doing the work. I'm just not certain um, what the overarching goal is and, and what we're trying to achieve other than you know, decimating ISIS, but what's beyond that? What are, we what are we doing looking at Al Qaeda? When we're talking about the ideology in general and his, his question, um, Al Qaeda themselves sees ISIS as ridiculous and that just killing people isn't gonna be something that's sustaining for them, that they jumped over several steps that they needed to have before they established a caliphate. So we've still got this organization out there, Al Qaeda, that's attracting people and they still have an intent on hurting the United States. And there's people I know that are still at the agency working on that. We have a fair number of people who have uh, addressed a question to Joby about uh, possible links between North Korea and, uh, and, and terrorism. Mm. You know, the, the North Koreans have had a, a long and illust illustrious career in aiding terrorist organizations. And in, we know that because we've, we've, we've studied some of this or have directly in my work. Uh, providing weapons to, you know, missiles to Hezbollah in the past. Um, you know, terrorists in Latin America, they've, they've earned a lot of their income by selling conventional weapons, which they have lots of, to whoever is willing to buy them. We haven't seen the kind of links between North Korea and these uh, Islamist groups that we're, that we're fighting in Syria and Iraq right now. And I think the reason is because there are such completely different universes. There's not really much of an opportunity for overlap. We see North Korea continuing to supply things to the Assad regime, including precursors for chemical weapons, chemical weapons, defense gear, all kinds of stuff that Assad uses to kill his own people. But there doesn't seem to be enough of a, a kind of a, a, an infrastructure or a, a network for these to get together. One can never rule it out. I mean, uh, always, uh, you know, you know, people who have a common enemy may find ways to, to collude, but just don't really see much of it in practice. Great, gentlemen in the first row. What? Please, if you could wait for the microphone. What other forms of terrorism and what other terrorist groups are around? We've been talking about Muslim, but uh, what about in domestic, we've had a variety of terrorist domestic groups. Ireland has been plagued with terrorism. What other groups are making use of the dark web now and how? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. And it's important right now because you know, we, we do have counter extremism programs that our government runs. And in the past, it's been all extremists. So there's been funding to groups, uh, there's a group called Love Not Hate that, that is made up of former uh, right-wing extremists, uh, you know, KKK, other sort of, you know, far-right nationalist groups, and try to, you know, to, uh, to address those issues and try to bring those people back to a more reasonable point of view. Those programs have been cut. I mean, this new administration likes to, likes to, to fight Islamist terrorist uh, networks wherever they can, and they're, and they're arguably putting a lot of resources into that. But all the other extremist groups are being ignored, and that's important because the number of people killed by other extremist groups in this country is very close to actually the number who've been killed from by jihadists. It's in the dozens of people over the last 15 years, every, from, from the far left to, uh, to KKK groups and to others. And you, you can't ignore you know, one kind of extremism because, because you don't feel it's important or your base doesn't like it. And, and just focus on another because we have a, a bigger problem with extremism in this country that's not, not just limited to Muslims. And if we just limit to Muslims, we're sending a, a message to our allies and friends who are Muslim that who should be helping us is that this really is a campaign against Islam and we don't want to give that message because it, it really hurts us in the long run. Ada, would you like to add anything to that? Well, I think it not only hurts us in the long run, it's just the wrong thing for us to do. I mean, collectively, as a country, we are made up of, you know, many different people, and this is a melting pot, supposedly. And to keep it that way, I think we have to apply these extreme, 
extremism measures universally. And it can't be just choosing and picking what seems to be the political will of the day. And I, again, I don't think that was necessarily just this administration. I think there is a, you know, a cycle, a political cycle that all of these policies fall on. And I think that is really a huge detriment to our counterterrorism and counter, counter radicalization. Great. Uh, gentleman over there in the blue shirt. Um, I wanted to ask and more elaborate with the idea of our security and terrorism um, for the idea, for example, let's say um, it, there was a statistic that came out with the TSA that all the things that they're doing, 70% of items that they're supposed to catch are actually going through. And there's jokes that go around that we have a bottle of water that you can't take on an airplane and yet they throw it into a garbage can, which if it were a bomb, it's next to people that can be endangered. So I wanted to ask you, and we were talking about a little bit earlier, what are your ideas that for us to be more secure and yet things that would actually help us to fight terrorism here domestically or are politicians just throwing out things that sound great and it has the word security on it but it does absolutely nothing because everybody that travels now through airports are more miserable than what they <laughs> what they need to be. It's achieved that effect anyway. <laughs> <laughs> kind of depress air travel altogether. There, that is a perfect example of not updating policies and prescriptions along with what the actual threat is. Um, I mean, TSA is frustrating for all of us to have to go through that. And if it's just the appearance is just a Band-Aid effect or not effective, you know, you have to question, what are we doing this for? And Congress should be asking these questions. This is a, they're funding a program that's costing lots of money and aggravating everyone. And to what end? Um, I mean, that was the same example I guess I had with the travel ban. Applying these kinds of resources to things that don't work and not updating them is just n taking away from being able to actually enact real policy. But as far as what to do. Can I pin you down a little bit on that? Yeah, exactly. You. Uh, well, <laughs> I mean, I do think there's a layer of security that needs to happen, of course, at the airport. You know, you, we can't ignore that. Um, but I think there is a level of what we're willing to give up from our own you know, personal freedoms and our to what we're going to give our, over to TSA to be able to analyze anything. There's, there's that struggle, as well as the fact that what they currently have in place, I think, is just not sufficient. I think the training needs to be updated. I think some of the tools can be changed. There's an issue with funding, I think, for some of the more sophisticated things that they could be using. So I think that the opportunity is there. It's just that this needs to be addressed by DHS. I'm going to go for that gentleman back there with the, the tie, glasses and the tie. Of course, I don't have my glasses on, so I'm not sure that he really has glasses on. Uh, the, the origin of Islamic terrorism is a religion. And our Western uh, states and governments are secular organizations that are not accustomed to dealing with religion. Is that a significant, has that been, and is, does it continue to be a significant disconnect and how these secular governments in the West deal with something that is self-avowedly religious in nature? Well, I would say it's a bastardization of a religion. It's not, you know, the religion itself. And right after 9-11, that's exactly what the, our country was struggling with. How do we figure out how to analyze and understand some of our allies in the Middle East um, when this is connected to a religious principle that they can identify with, yet it's not. It's disconnected and it's living on its own as a radicalized form of this. So I think that is a challenge for Western governments, and it has been a challenge. It's a cultural divide that I think slowly we are learning to figure out how to navigate. And, you know, I'm sure Joby has done a lot of traveling in the Middle East and has seen this as well, but when I was working with our counterparts in intelligence, you know, it's, we had no problems sharing information and talking one-on-one, -on -one, but when it comes to the, the formal structure of being able to, you know, trust each other and, and understanding the types of information that you share, you know, it's, it's still difficult, I think, probably to this day and with some countries just because they don't have as much control on some of the information also that we're sharing. 
Jeremy, there are a couple ways uh, to answer that question. Do you have a different perspective? I just just a couple of observations. We, a couple of things we have to remember is that, and have to keep telling ourselves this: many more Muslims die from 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 Muslim extremism and, and from groups like ISIS than than Westerners. Many hundreds of times more. This is a problem for them too. The other thing is that it's it is hard for us as Westerners as as non-Muslims to tell Muslims what to believe, but we do have to empower our allies who are trying to, to, to fight this fight. I mean, you, even uh, you know, President el-Sisi of, of Egypt, no Democrat, but he's gone to the, the seat of, of Sunni Muslim learning in Cairo to Azhar University and said, we need a reformation. They're going through the same kind of struggle that, that Christianity had centuries ago, trying to figure out where the separation is between religion and, and the state and what, what the line should be. And this is going to take a long time to play out. We can not necessarily do it for them, but we can make things worse by, by you know, perpetrating the perception that we're enemies of Islam or that we're at war with Islam. We have to empower Muslims who are on our side or allies in fighting this fight with us and not do things to make their job harder. I've got one last question I'm going to take from here. It's a little bit Slightly off topic, but it's like the most voted topic I've seen since I've been doing any of these. And it's uh, directed towards NADA. Uh, and there, there's sort of two questions, both got a lot of votes. Uh, uh, one is, uh, why did you decide to leave the CIA if there's a lot of important work uh, going on there? And uh, what's morale like right now? Are the best and brightest still uh, joining the intelligence services? First one's easy. <laughs> I was burnt out after 9-11 and after dealing with the Iraq issue. And once I started working in the Joint Terrorism Task Force, I figured out, oh, there's like a structure and a life and you can go home like around <laughs> six, seven o'clock at night and I'm interested in that. So I took a break for a while and I just never gravitated back toward the mothership in DC. So I ended up staying. Um, the question. The hard question. I, I mean, I still have friends there. Talk to them. They're all still gainfully employed. Um, I think there's some, of course, any any change in administration, there's uh, struggles with, you know, what's the direction? What are we going to be doing? Who's going to be my boss? You know, because it does trickle down, of course, in the bureaucracy. Um, there were certainly, a, I'm you know, I'm speaking just from the, the anecdotal perspectives I had received. Some issues around trust of the intelligence community. Will their work be valued? Will their work be utilized when informing policy or decision making? Um, and are they going to be a, still an integral part of the US government national security apparatus under this administration when there were so many negative things that were, were said initially? So they need to remember that the long war we requires uh, playing the long game. Uh, thank you very much for participating uh, on this panel. Thanks to everyone else. I'd like, I'd like to remind you that uh, the bar is still open and we're going to have a networking session uh, at the end of, well, now. <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.